All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the first Friday Night Lights church service that we're having here. All right. So we're going to be opening up the uh, the service. We're going to be talking about getting back up. And we're actually going to start. We're going to start in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter twenty four, verse sixteen. That's going to be our first one. So if you want to go ahead and open up there, we're going to start with some music by the band Vesparum.
to the first Friday Night Lights uh, service that we're having here. Why did we call this Friday Night Lights? Well, we're supposed to be lights. We're supposed to let God's light shine through us. And being that it's Friday night, a lot of people are <clears throat> looking for something to do without getting into trouble. So this is a way to reach out to those, for, to give people something to do on a Friday night besides going out and getting themselves into trouble. Uh, it's also, you know, in Texas, Friday Night Lights is, refers to the high school football thing. So we decided to use that to that that terminology to talk about on Friday nights. Let's get in the Word of God. Let's be the light. Let's worship on Friday nights and get into that. So first, let's open up with the prayer, and then we'll get into today's message. So if you'll bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we just we just come to you right now, and Lord, we just want we want this to be your message. We want your words to come through tonight, Lord. And Lord, we we we're praying for all of the people that are in need of your healing, that are in need of your peace, Lord. There's there's so many people out there right now that are that are hurting, and Lord, we just ask for your peace and your guidance to be in those situations. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, <clears throat> so. The title of today's message is Get Back Up. Get Back Up. You know, <clears throat> back whenever I was a kid, one of the first CDs that I that I bought was from a one-hit wonder band that I thought was going to be, they were going to be something. You may remember this tune if you're old like me. It's from a band called Chumba Wumba. Funny name. They have their 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 one hit song was called "I Get Knocked Down." The song was when something like "I Get Knocked Down, But I Get Up Again." You're never gonna keep me down, and it just kind of repeated that over and over. Was there other words to the song? I don't know. The main point that I that I remember was "I Get Knocked Down, But I Get Up Again." You're never gonna keep me down. But how many times do we get knocked down? And we don't want to get back up. How easy is it to get knocked down and stay down? It's hard to get back up. It's hard to get back up when you've gotten knocked down and you're laying there and you know if you get back up, you've got to face that. If you so much as get back up, you've got to face what it is that knocked you down. It's not an easy thing to do. You know that that just knocked you down, and if you so much as stand back up, you know they're coming at you again. Whatever the situation is. So, let's read from Proverbs 24, verse 16. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Might want to put a bookmark somewhere in here, because we're going to go into the book of Proverbs again later. So, you may want to just put a bookmark here. Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, Though a righteous man falls seven times, he will get up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. Different translations may have that worded a little different, but the point is, even the righteous will fall. It says, it says seven times. Seven times. But he gets back up seven times. But it says the wicked will stumble and fall into ruin. So what is that saying? What does that mean? It means that even the righteous will stumble and fall, but they get back up. The wicked, when they fall, they stay down there. And they wallow around in that whatever it is situation that they fell into. They don't get back up. They stay down 
they waller around in that. They waller around in their in their pity. They waller around in those things, and it's an easy thing to do. Life starts hitting you. Different things start smacking you around. You don't want to get back up and keep facing that over and over again, getting hit. Who wants to continue getting hit? But you got to get back up and face that that's in front of you. You got to get back up. You got to have the strength. And where do we get our strength? We get our strength from the Lord. We want to turn <clears throat> to the New Testament. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians now. It's going to take a minute to flip over there. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I've got my bookmark here, but i got to get to it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians being <clears throat> in the New Testament, it's one of Paul's letters. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. But this is one of Paul's letters that he wrote. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 8. 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> and it says, we are, pressure, oh, excuse me, we are pressured in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We will always carry the death of Jesus in our own body so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. What does it say there? What is that saying? What does that mean? It says we're pressured in every way. We've got pressure from every which direction. We've got all these different things crushing in on us, but we're not crushed. We've got all these different pressures. We've got all these different temptations. We've got all these different things smacking us around, but we're not defeated. But we're not defeated. It says we're pressured but not crushed. We're perplexed but not in despair. We're not in despair. It says we're persecuted but not abandoned. God will never leave or forsake you. We're persecuted but not abandoned. We're struck down but not destroyed. We may get knocked down but we get up again. I get knocked down, but I get up again. You're never going to keep me down. Now, who was it that wrote this? Who was it that wrote this? This is Paul that wrote this letter to the church whenever he's talking about this. Now, something about Paul. Paul literally got knocked off of his horse by Jesus. Paul got back up again. So, Paul knows something about failures. Paul knows something about falling. Paul, before he was known as Paul, was known as Saul. Somebody that was going around killing anyone that was claiming the name of Jesus. He knew, when Paul wrote this, he had already gone through that and gone through a transformation where Jesus literally knocked him off his horse and blinded him for three days. Paul was blinded and had to go to a Christian who God told him Paul was coming. And this guy says, I don't want nothing to do with that guy. And Paul had to go to him so that this man could pray over him. And these, 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 these scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see again. There were some other things that this guy had to do. We're not going to get into that. There was other things this guy had to do to help get the scales to fall from his eyes. But um, the point is, Paul learned from his failures. Paul learned from all those things that he had done and he got back up. We have to learn from our failures. You know, <laughs> how do we learn? 
How do we learn in this life? How do we learn anything? We learn from messing it up to begin with. You can't expect to go into something right from the beginning being great at it. It's not going to happen. You're going to mess up before you do it good. So, I'm going to be told you to put a bookmark at, at, at the Proverbs 24. Just go back to that bookmark that you put in there. We're going to go to Proverbs 26. Should be like a page over. Proverbs 26, verse 11. Proverbs 26, verse 11. And let's see what it has to say about learning from your failure. Proverbs 26, verse 11. And it says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. You ever heard of the definition of insanity? Was being doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? Proverbs here is telling you that like a dog that returns to his vomit, so is a person that repeats the same foolish accidents and doesn't learn from them. So you've got to get back up. You got to learn when you get back up. You got to learn what it was that knocked you down. You got to learn from it. You know, <laughs> you got to learn from those things that you've done. You learn from it. And then, what you can do then is once you've learned from that mistake that you made, if you see somebody else going down that same road, going down that same path, you have the knowledge to then tell them, hey man, I've already been down that road. Don't do that. Let's do this instead. You have the knowledge and you have the power to help someone else that's making the same mistakes that you've made because you got back up. You raised yourself back up and learned from it and you can help somebody else to keep them from making the same mistakes that you have. You don't want to return to that vomit and you don't want somebody else eating that vomit. You don't, you don't want to go back and eat that vomit. You know that it was a mistake and you don't want somebody else going over there and eating that same pile of vomit. Learn, get back up and learn from it. James, look at James. We're going to flip over to James. I know we're going back and forth from Old Testament to New Testament because the whole Bible is important and the whole, it repeats different ways. James, chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. James, back of the Bible, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Says, Consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. James is telling us you're going to face trials, you're going to face testing, you're going to experience different things, and you've got to have the endurance to get back up. You can't let it knock you down and keep you down. You've got to get back up and keep fighting. You've got to get back up and keep fighting. You're going to face these different things. You're going to face different trials. And he says, consider it joy because it produces the endurance. But endurance must do its complete work. So you can't, you can't get back up once and get knocked down and then give up. You may get knocked down seven times like it says in Proverbs. It's got to do its complete work. You have to get stronger. So, let's really put this into, a, into something you might can, can understand. So let's say boxing, okay? A boxer doesn't walk into the ring the first day. First day of training, he goes in there, hits the bag a couple of times, gets in the ring. He's not going to face Mike Tyson. Because Mike Tyson would knock him out cold in a second, right? So, the first time he gets into the ring, that boxer is going to face somebody on his level, right? Somebody else is pretty new. They have a good match because they're both new. So, say that boxer gets knocked down. Refs over there counting. One, two, 
He looks up and he's like, all right, I got knocked down. All right, he caught me with the right cross on this one. I did, I did my head a little bit. He caught me with the right cross. So if I don't dip my head as much, he comes with that right cross. Maybe I can counter and not dip my head. I can counter and I can catch him. So you learn. And you're sitting there thinking you watch every boxing match or MMA, whatever. You watch every match. and it, 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 I use boxing because you've got the ref that's counting. You watch that. And if they take the knee, if it's a standing A count, they got to just be standing up by eight. They can take a knee until that, that eight. And the whole time they're thinking, okay, what happened? What happened? Okay, he caught me here. Okay, okay. And you've got the corner. The corner man's yelling at him, telling him, okay, man, you did this, you did that. You've got to watch for this, you got to watch for that. They're giving him pointers so that he can learn from those mistakes. And he can get back up and continue fighting. But as that boxer, as he continues going, as he continues learning and getting better and working out and strengthening himself and getting that endurance and building himself up, he gets better and he gets better and he gets better. But as he gets better, so does his competition. As we get stronger, as we get stronger in the faith, our competition is going to get stronger too. We're no longer facing somebody that's their first time in the ring. We're facing a heavyweight. We're facing a champion. We're, 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 we're facing. Now we're, we've built up the endurance. Now we might be facing Mike Tyson. Right? We may be getting in there looking at him going, oh boy. Well, one of the things about that is, Satan's not going to fight as hard for already won ground. Once he wins you and he keeps you down, you're already lost. You don't have to worry about you as much. So as we get stronger in the faith, we're going to face stronger trials. We're going to face stronger temptations. We're going to face more things coming at us left and right because we're now strong enough to fight against those things. We're now strong enough to, to face those things, and, and even though you might be strong enough to, sometimes you're still going to get knocked down, but you've got to get back up. You've got to learn from these different things. If you go into a, to a martial arts studio, be it karate, taekwondo, judo, whatever, one of the things that, 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 that they'll tell you is what's the difference between a master at martial arts and a student? What's the difference? The difference is that the, the master has failed more times than the student has tried. The master has failed more times than the student has tried yet. You have to fail and learn in, in order to get better. And I'll give you one from, from myself, okay? I play hockey, and I'm a goalie. I switched from defense to goalie recently, and, and I've been playing goalie. Well, this past Saturday, I went out there, and I'm playing goalie, and it's a drop-in game, so it's like a pickup game. You know, these people show up and, you know, split off into teams and whatever. It's like a pickup game. So I'm playing goalie, and <clears throat> a minor league team shows up. They're, 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 they're a legit minor league team. I've only been playing goalie for five, six months max. And I'm playing against a minor league team. So we get done playing. I did okay. I didn't do terrible. I did okay. We get back into the locker room and I, you know, I told the guys, the guys on the minor league team, I said, hey, come at me with everything you've got. Don't hold up. Don't pull your shots. Come at me with everything you've got. And they kind of looked at me funny and I said, look, if you score on me 15 times today, you score 15 goals on me today, next Saturday you're only going to score 14 because I'm going to learn at least one of them. I'm going to learn. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to come back at you. I'm going to get better. I'm going to learn at least one of those things. 
So even though you might score 15 today, you're only going to score 14 next week. Now, they didn't score 15 goals on me that Saturday, but I'm just saying, I don't know if they were coming at, with, coming at me with everything either. But I'm only going to learn if I face bigger challenges. I'm only going to get better if I face people that are better than me. And that's in hockey, right? We can take that to everyday life. You're only going to get better if you're working your faith muscles out. And sometimes it hurts. You know whenever you work out, whenever you lift weights, whenever you work out, you're actually tearing part of your muscle so that it can grow back stronger, so that it can grow back and bigger and your muscles grow. It hurts. You go run. I hate running. It hurts. It hurts my side. I can't hardly breathe. My side hurts. My legs start cramping up. I hate running. But it produces endurance. The only way you're going to get better and get more endurance and get stronger at it is through the pain. Sometimes we got to fight through the pain. We got to get back up. We got to learn, get back up, learn from our mistakes, and continue going. You can't give up. You can't give up, no matter what it is that, that you're facing. No matter what it is that, that is your opponent in the ring. Whatever it is that your opponent in the ring that knocked you down, you've got to learn. And as the rest counting, you've got to be thinking, what can I do different? What, what can I do different? And you also got to rely on your corner. Who is in your corner? God. God's never going to leave you or forsake you. You've got to listen to what he's telling you. Your corner man is telling you how to defeat this. Your corner man's yelling at you, putting the ice on your wounds as you go over to the corner, and he's giving you advice. He's telling you how to beat it, but you've got to listen to him. You've got to allow him to dress your wounds. You've got to allow him to put that ice on your eye. You've got to allow him to and listen to him whenever he's telling you how you can go about this, and he's going to give you the strength. That water that he squirted in your mouth, that, <laughs> Jesus is the living water. So you gotta, you got to rely on him. you got to get that strength, and you got to get back up, and you've got to keep fighting. You can't water there. Now, one last scripture that we're going to read. One last scripture that we're going to read. It comes from the book of Malachi. You know, we were going back and forth from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is the last book in the Old Testament. Book of Malachi. Not quoted from very often in sermons. Malachi, chapter 3, verse 3. The last book of the Old Testament. A lot of prophecy about Jesus. Malachi, chapter 3. Verse 3. And it says, He will be like a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Now he talks about being refined like gold and silver. He talks about going through and refining them like gold and silver. Now, my first job, whenever, actually it was my second job, but I worked two jobs at the same time in high school. Uh, one of my first jobs was at a jewelry shop. And I was a polisher, so I know a little bit about jewelry and how it's refined and how it's smelted down and, and all the different things that go into making jewelry. Whenever you have gold... And you want to make, let's say you got you got some old rings that you want to make something make it something new with. You take the gold and you drop it into a uh, like a cauldron, and it's heated up and it's melted down. Now the thing about it is, when you melt it down, there's going to be this stuff that comes up to the top. That's most people call that slag. It's the impurities. It's the impurities from that gold. And you can take gold straight out of the ground and, and melt it down, and it's going to have impurities. It's going to have other minerals. It's going to have other things that's going to come up to the top. And it forms this, this layer, and it's a real nasty, black, burnt layer on top of the liquid gold. 
It's this nasty looking stuff, and it's the impurities. Now think about that. That's the impurities that are coming up to the top, and you've got to scoop out the impurities. You've got to remove the impurities. But the only way that you can do that is by putting it under extreme heat. The only way that you can get those impurities out of that gold is by extreme heat and scooping out all those impurities that float up to the top when you have it under that heat. Now, whenever we face different trials, when we face different things, when we face different testings and we're put under that fire, that's going to bring some of our impurities to the top. They're going to be right there where you can see all of our impurities when we're put under fire. When we're put to the test, when we're put under the fire, our impurities rise up to the top for everybody to see. That's whenever you're going to, when you're put under the fire, that's whenever everybody can see what your impurities are. At least you can. At the very least, you can see your impurities. Now, after that's done, you scoop off the impurities. Then you pour it into a mold. You mold it out. What's the next thing you got to do? Then you got to sand it. You got to shape it and sand it. You got to take off even more. You got to sand it. Sand it down. To get the shape that you want. There's a lot of very fine sanding, a lot of very fine little details that have to be sanded out in order for you to get that ring necklace or whatever it is, pendant that it is that you're making. And it's not going to feel good. You're taking stuff off. It's not going to feel good. Sometimes when we go through different things, it's in order for us to learn and it's not going to feel good. It's not going to always feel good. And just like running makes my side hurt, sometimes you've got to go through that pain in order to get better. I also want to talk about, you know, with you, when you got the jewelry in you, we talked about melting and not getting the impurities off and, and shaping just that, just the shape of the ring. Now let's talk about the diamond. How is that diamond, that beautiful thing, that centerpiece of the jewelry, how is that created? How is that created? Well, you have to have extreme heat and extreme pressure in order to create diamonds. And the most sought after diamonds cannot be reproduced in a lab. Lab created diamonds they cannot recreate the amount of pressure and the amount of heat that is found in these diamond caves. They down and down deep in the center of the earth. You they can't reproduce that amount of heat and pressure at the same time to turn that coal into the same quality of diamond. Have they created lab diamonds? Yes, obviously they have. But it's it's not the same. Extreme heat and extreme pressure to just create the diamond. And whenever a raw diamond that's uncut comes in, it looks nothing like what you get in that diamond. It doesn't have the sparkle. It doesn't have the, the angles. It doesn't have the reflectivity. That's all that a diamond, the reason it sparkles is because they take it and they cut down and they cut different angles on that diamond in order for it to reflect light different ways to give it that sparkle. But in order for it to get that sparkle, they've got to cut angles into it. they got to cut away pieces of it. And cut all these different angles all throughout it to where, number one, it fits into the setting that you want it to fit into, whether it be a baguette or a princess cut or whatever cut of diamond that you've got. It's got to fit in the setting, but then it also has to have just the right amount of angles on it to perfectly reflect the light from all different angles to where it gives it that sparkle. So a diamond goes through more fire, more heat, more pressure, more cutting, but it has to go 
through all those things to be the precious, beautiful thing that men buy whenever they mess up something. You have to go through all these different things in order to come out the other side, in order to get through it, being the creation that you were meant to be. And we're going to continue to go through more and more trials, more and more testing, and more and more endurance we have to build in order to get through those. James says, count it all joy because you're going to get stronger. But the only way you're going to get stronger is if you don't lay there and waller. Don't lay on the ground and waller and, 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 and get upset and, oh, I, I messed up. I can't do this anymore. Look, God knows that you're going to make mistakes. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work for the greater good for those who love Him and are called according to His service. All things. God knew you were going to mess up. He knew you were going to mess up. And He's going to use that. If you allow Him to teach you and you get the endurance and you get back up, He's going to use that. If you listen to Him and you allow Him, He's going to use all those things that you think you messed up on, and maybe you did. He's going to use all those things in ways to help someone else, to help you, to help someone else. He's going to use it to further glorify God. God's going to use you to further glorify Him through those things that you thought you messed up on. But you've got to get back up and you've got to listen and you've got to learn. You have to get back up. You have to learn from your mistakes. And you're going to make them. You're going to make mistakes. The only way you're going to get better, the only way that you're going to get stronger, the only way you're going to get better is by trying it, messing up, and continuing. You learn from what you did. So, guys, I just, I, I want to, I really want to get that point across to you that you got, you can't sit there and keep doing the same things over and over and expect a different result. You've got to learn from it. You've got to rely on him. You've got to rely on his strength to help you get back up and face that. Because we can't face that in front of us. You know, I've used the boxing, the boxing analogy. We can't face Mike Tyson on our own. We can't face those, those, those things that are knocking us down. We can't face them alone. We've got to have help. You've got to rely on his help to get you back up. You've got to listen to him whenever he's telling you what to do to get past it. That's the only way we're going to get through this. So, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. If you'll bow your heads in prayer with me, please. Dear God, we just thank you for this message. We thank you for your continued strength. We thank you for continuing to be with us and giving, giving us the strength to get back up, Lord. Lord, we, we, we will count it joy whenever we face these different trials whenever, because we know we're getting stronger. We know we're getting stronger, Lord, and we just, we just ask for your strength to help us. We ask for your peace and your comfort to help us to continue going, to continue fighting the fight, to continue spreading your, your word, to continue spreading your glory. And Lord, we just, ask, we just ask for a restful night. We ask that everybody that's watching this have, have a, a, a blessed night and a restful night's sleep tonight. And Lord, we just... We continue to ask to, for you to help us to want what you want. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. So with that, I will be, uh, I'll be back on Sunday morning at 11. We're going to replay this message on Wednesday night for anybody that missed it. And we'll be live again Sunday morning. And then we'll be live again for another Friday Night Lights next Friday at 8 p.m. Love you guys. Take care. Stay safe.